Well, it's mid-November and the garden is actually looking quite nice. There's a lot of harvesting to do, so I got my harvest basket, but I also wanted to give you guys an update of how everything is looking, kind of talk about some of the plants here, and maybe give a couple tips for growing through the winter. So let's get started with an overview, then I'll grab my basket and we'll do some serious harvesting. So just to kick it off, we have the green chard on this side, and we have quite a few of these shelling peas to harvest. These are the shelling peas I put in actually in the summertime, and they have produced quite nicely. There's a lot of peas to harvest today, but as you can see, they're also dying back. And that is because we've had Santa Ana weather here for about two weeks, which is where the desert winds will blow in and it'll actually get really hot and dry, which the peas hate. So not a big deal. I did get a quite a big harvest over here. And as you'll see on the back over there, I have more peas on the trellis net right over there. Now I want to quickly talk about growing tomatoes in the winter time. It is possible if you live in a mild climate area like San Diego, but you want to be careful about which variety you choose. This one right here is called Husky Cherry. It's one of the few hybrid tomatoes I'll grow every year, usually around this time. And they make a really actually wonderful tasting cherry tomato. And that's the tip number one. If you grow a tomato in the winter time, you want to make sure it is a cherry tomato. That's because these guys can actually still produce even with less sunlight hours, whereas a bigger beefsteak tomato actually needs 10, 12 plus hours of sunlight just to set a fruit. So they're just not going to work no matter what. You could do whatever you want. You could try to warm it up. If it doesn't get enough light, it's just not going to fruit. So cherry tomatoes are the ones that you want to go with. We'll go ahead and start off the basket here with that one cherry tomato. I have a feeling we're going to need a second basket though. Now another quick overview over here. As I mentioned, we do have more peas on this trellis. So they're just starting to come up. I actually probably need to add another string here because some of them are not quite reaching. I want to make sure that they get up on the net like so. So actually that might be enough to do it, just getting a tendril attached. But these are actually uh, snap peas. So these will be the secondary peas that I'm growing after those shelling peas get harvested. And down here, I have showed you guys this before. This is where I have a little wildflower patch. and. The dominant one that seems to have taken here are California poppies. I'm not upset about that at all. I love California poppies, but I know I've seen a couple lupins in here and actually I believe a snapdragon and a couple other interesting little flowering plants. So looking forward to that actually producing. I have some carrots on the back wall here and over here is going to be a major part of our harvest today. This is my broccoli. So as you can see, Got a huge head of broccoli here. It's been quite chilly these past couple nights, so I suspect this will taste quite sweet. If you didn't know about this, actually when you have plants experience cold, they do taste sweeter. So things like kale, broccoli, they will taste much, much better if you let them actually experience some cold weather. Now in San Diego, the coldest it ever gets is maybe 30 degrees, and that's actually enough for these plants to taste better as well. As a natural solution to avoid freezing, they will produce sugar, which makes them taste sweeter, so that benefits us. So this guy's gonna get harvested. I'll show you all the side shoot production. And actually, you know what? I think it's time to get harvesting because there's a lot out here. And there's still a lot more to show you. So I'm gonna start off here by harvesting out all of these cherry tomatoes on that husky cherry I showed you earlier. Decent little harvest here, enough to make a salad for lunch today. So go ahead and throw those in the basket here. Now let's go down. Oh, whoa, I just saw something exciting. Nice. The cauliflower is starting to head. This is wonderful. It is a little bit loose. I think that's due to the heat that we've been having here these past couple weeks, but it should be totally fine. I want to make sure I cover this up with leaves so it stays nice and white. Over here, we're over in the broccoli zone. The variety of broccoli in question here is actually Bell Star Broccoli. This is one that does really well in warmer temperatures, which is exactly why I sowed it, because I knew that these cold Santa and the winds would come and ruin my broccoli otherwise. So check that out. Quite a nice little head of broccoli here. I want to give it a little taste test. <laughs> it's so much better than anything you could get at the store. There's sweetness to it. There's like a little bit of vibrancy. The bottom looks absolutely beautiful. It has no scarring or weird diseases on it. It's hard to find broccoli like this at the store. And also it's hard to know how it was grown. This I knew is grown very nicely organically with nothing weird on it. And that's why I feel so comfortable eating it straight out of my garden. So right over here on this plant, I've already harvested out the main head. And if you look right here, there's another little broccoli shoot. This is the side shoot production that you get from broccoli. It will happen anywhere where there is a leaf in that little stem to leaf node. That is where that new broccoli ferret will form. And it will continue to do that until the plant dies. So right here, this is my broccoli factory from here until springtime when I decide I'm sick of it and I want to pull them out. But for now, 
This is the actual one, two, three. This is the third head I've got. And actually underneath me, I have another head on the way. So great year for broccoli so far. I'm very excited to see it. But now we've got some more harvesting to do. So here's the broccoli bed and our little broccoli harvest in the basket. And if you step back a little bit, you'll see the grafted tomato. This is the one that I did for my grafted tomato reel that has done quite well. And just take a look at the plant itself. You'll see that there's very little to no disease. If there is, it's isolated to a couple like leaf nodes like this over here. But the bulk of the plant itself looks extremely happy and healthy. So I attribute all that to the graft because all my other tomatoes look like trash right now, especially an heirloom. This is an heirloom Cherokee purple. It shouldn't be this resistant to disease. Now, an interesting thing is that it actually does have a flower setting. Um, there's not probably enough light for these to turn to fruit. And also another factor is that when it gets cold, it's actually really hard for the tomatoes to ripen. This has been ripening here for quite some time now. I don't know the exact timeline, but it's just so cold, even physically feels like a cold tomato. Now I will be doing grafting again based on the fact that this is doing so well right now, but the thing I'll change is that I'll do it earlier in the season instead of waiting so long. Now to the left of that, in the spirit of touring, we have my wooden raised bed. This is filled with salad crops like the little gem lettuces on the left here. It's also full of nice looking cauliflower that's starting to head up, which I'm very excited for. So there's four cauliflowers here. And on the right edge on this side, it's entirely planted out with red Russian kale, which is also doing really, really well. I have to say it's been a wonderful start to the year this year. It's making me very optimistic for a wonderful winter harvest. Now on this side, I have my peppers now. As you could see, there's quite a lot of peppers on here that I need to harvest. We just got kind of burnt out eating seasonally. You get very excited for things like peppers and tomatoes. And then when you get too many, you get kind of bored of it. At least that's what happened to us this year. And you just don't have as much desire to eat it. Now you can see that I have planted some fava beans around these peppers to serve as a cover crop. I need to go ahead and fill out the rest of them, but they've already sprouted, which is wonderful because I plan on overwintering these peppers directly in the ground here. Now I also wanted to show you guys Probably the most exciting thing, at least for me, is down here. This is my wine cap mushroom bed. It's actually one of two of them. I built one for a video and I built one for a short form. This is the first one I built for a short form. And as you can see, it is covered in mushrooms. Very exciting stuff here. I am super, super stoked about it. There's a ton of mushrooms, maybe 20. I don't know, we'll see. I'm expecting most of them will probably be ready to harvest today. But it's so fun to see them just poking out of the ground like this. It just, <laughs> it's just amazing. I love it. This has only been here for less than two months, guys. So you can make your own mushroom bed, actually harvest them in as little as two months, depending on climate conditions. I think the Santa Ana actually helped in this case because the warm period tricked them into thinking it was spring. And then another cold period came back as winter, winter in San Diego actually set in. At this point, we've seen enough. I think it's time to do some harvesting. Here we are on the shell pea wall. So there's kind of three different types of peas. There's shelling peas, there's snow peas, there's snap peas. There's a little bit more distinction beyond that, but that's the main categories for edible peas. Now, if I come in here, what I'm going to do is harvest a couple that I think are perfectly ripe, harvest a couple that are overripe, and harvest a couple that are a little on the underripe side so I can show you guys exactly what to look for when you're harvesting your peas. So here's my little bushel of peas here. First, let's start off with one that's overripe. Take a look at that. See how it has this loss of color to it? It's not as green as the other ones. It also has a rough texture to it. You could fully see the peas on the outside. If I were to peel this open, or if I do peel this open, what you'll see is that the peas are extremely plump. They're very large and they're very, very firm as well. It's very hard to show you guys a round thing without rolling away. So there's an example right there. If I eat this, it's honestly disgusting. Very starchy. There's, <laughs> there's no sugar in there at all. Horrible. You don't want to eat them like that. If they get to that stage, you can't eat them, but you have to cook them first. Otherwise, they will not be good. You'll think peas are disgusting for the rest of your life. Now let's go over one that's perfectly ripe. Here's the one that was overripe. You can see how pale it is in comparison to this one, which I call perfectly ripe. Let's crack this one open. What you'll notice is that the peas are not quite as large as that other one, but they will be plump and they will be oh so sweet. So check this out. Inside a nice little perfect pot of peas in there. That's good eating. So let me pop one of these in. <laughs> it's crazy how sweet these are. If you've ever had a shelling pea fresh out the garden like this, I guarantee you're gonna like it. I don't know why you wouldn't. It's actually candy, it's a vegetable. 
It's so good. These almost never make it into the house just because of how tasty they are to snack on. Please guys, try growing shelling peas. Underrated. They're good for your soil. They're pretty low maintenance. They will die and be all dramatic if it gets too dry for them, but they're so worth it. And man, that is a delicious snack. While we're over here, I'm gonna go ahead and harvest some of these peppers so I could get them on the drying rack later today. My plan with these is actually to make a random blend of paprika powder. So I just wanna take a collection of different peppers, some hot, some sweet, dry them all up, turn them into a powder and use them as a unique sort of paprika that nobody else can buy, nobody else can have, because I don't even know what the blend or ratio of peppers are that I'm gonna be putting in here. And that's just one of the things that's going to make it so much fun. I'm gonna grab a couple of these Sugar Rush peach peppers. That's going to be some of the pop of spice in there. Very nice tropical flavors, but they also definitely pack a punch. Now over on this side, I have some Padron peppers, which are extremely delicious. They're very fruity, but they're also, it turns out, very spicy, especially when they're red. So I'm gonna also grab a couple of these. Maybe it'll be a hot pepper mix because these are so tasty. I definitely want to make sure I put some of these guys in. These long ones are called Escamillo peppers. They're considered an Italian frying pepper. The ones that are more bell-shaped are the Orange Sun from Botanical Interest, as well as the Padrones are from Botanical Interest as well. These are all peppers I'm going to be growing again next year because I found them to be very delicious and actually quite prolific. So with this harvest now on its way, we have a couple peas, a head of broccoli, some peppers and some tomatoes. Let's go over to the other side of the garden and see what we can find there. All right, guys, I actually lied to you. We're over here on the patio next to the garden because I have a very special harvest here. This is a lemon guava, one of my favorite guavas by far. It's not as prolific as the strawberry guava, but it does taste better in my opinion. So these are definitely my favorite now. There's three of them right there. I'm gonna throw them in the basket. But if we take a step back over here, let me show you the strawberry guava. So there it is. As you can see, it is absolutely loaded with fruits. Some of them are still ripening. They should be totally a dark red if they're ready to go, but they do look fantastic. And there's, I don't know, hundreds of them, maybe <laughs> at least 100 strawberry guavas here. So keeping an eye on these, most of them will probably ripen the rest of this week because they do have some red color to them. But the guava harvest has been wonderful this year. One of my favorite fruits, I'll probably be adding more of them because they're just so easy to grow and they're also just so delicious. Now we're over here on the North Garden, or at least that's what I like to call it. As you can see, I still have some of my cherry tomatoes in ground and also some of my peppers that I haven't quite removed yet. Now, we will harvest some of these cherry tomatoes, I'm sure, but let me give you a quick overview of how this garden is looking right now. All right, so here's a closer look of the peppers. I have some of these Mad Hatters here, which I'll also need to be harvested to dry up. I have some Italian frying peppers as well. And as I mentioned, I have quite a few cherry tomatoes, but just looking at these plants, you could tell that they're not as healthy as that grafted one. Some of them have a lot of wilt on the stems as well as the leaves. And actually the tomatoes themselves are a little bit diseased. When you see these kind of black spots on your tomatoes, that's generally a bad sign of disease. Sometimes it affects the flavor, sometimes it doesn't, but also it looks like I have some pests in here because this tomato is ripped open and it's not even ripe yet. So. Like I said, seasonal eating has kind of got me burnt out on eating these tomatoes now. I'm a little bit over them. So might just pull all these out this week. In fact, I almost certainly will. Now over on this side where I had my beefsteak tomatoes, I planted this broccoli in and I gave it a lot of space and just look how absolutely wonderful and happy and healthy it looks. There are six plants here and they're all gigantic. I can't wait to harvest from these. The leaves are so big, I know they're gonna produce some really, really wonderful broccoli. Now on this side, I have all the plants I put in on that vlog where I hurt my thumb. I'm still wearing a band-aid just to keep it clean, but it's doing much better now, guys, just to let you know. And all of these are also looking quite good. Now over here, I have something funny, which is I had a nasturtium growing here, and all of these are volunteer seeds. So I basically have a sea of nasturtiums now. <laughs> I probably should thin it out because it's getting a little bit out of hand. Now on this back wall, as you know, I put in these raised beds recently. This is the one that I planted out with garlic. It is that new next gen birdies that has the imperial spacing. So I have my spacing lines installed. And next to that is my gigantic four by eight bed. This is the biggest one that I have now. And it's a total mix of different types of brassicas. In the front here, I have a bunch of broccolis, which are looking again, really, really happy and healthy. In between them, I have these little micro cabbages. They're called tiara cabbages. They only get about this big, so they're not going to be massive. I put those 
so close for that exact reason because I knew that they wouldn't get massive. And on the back wall is what I thought was going to be Brussels sprouts. Turns out it's broccolini and I actually love broccolini. I like broccolini way more than I like regular broccoli. And also, honestly, probably much better than growing a bunch of Brussels sprouts, which you never know if they're actually going to produce here in San Diego. So all this broccolini is ready to harvest. We'll go ahead and grab it. This bed still needs to get planted out, but I do have some baby green chard seedlings in here to start it off. This was the first raised bed that I planted out and it's actually looking really healthy now. I mentioned when I planted this that some of the seedlings were a little bit stressed. They had been in their pots for a little bit too long and so the leaves were looking purple. So you could even see some of the older leaf here that's purplish. That's usually a nutrient deficiency. But as the plants established, they actually were able to bounce back. They now have nice green foliage and they look super happy and healthy. So I'm really happy I took that gamble there. Now over here, you'll see that all my containers are in a pile. This is due to a secret project. You may or may not see some of it in the background here. I won't spoil it, but there's something going up right there. So I won't go too far on that side because I don't want to ruin that surprise. But over here is my direct seated bed. This is the first fully direct seated garden bed that I've done since I started gardening. Since I had raised beds, I decided to do it again. The reason I stopped is because I had so much pest pressure when I did it in the ground that all my seedlings would get eaten up. But this turned out to work really wonderfully. The other thing that's really cool is that my beans actually look happy and healthy. They are producing flowers now, so I'm very excited for that to get some green bean harvest here in the winter time. And in the middle here, this is a sea of turnips. These are the Market Express turnips from Botanical Interest. Let's take a look down here. They produce these little white turnips. They're called like salad turnips. They're really sweet. They're crunchy. They're not as like bitter and gross as regular turnips are. Highly recommend if you guys don't think you like turnips and want to try them. And the final bed here is the last little holdout of summer as well. This is my plum tomato bed. So I actually have quite a few on there. My plan here is to turn this into sauce let them ripen a little bit longer. There's a little bit of heat left in this season, but the plant itself is definitely on its last legs. So just compare this to that grafted tomato. These are the same age. And as you can see, this one is covered in way more disease pressure than that grafted one is. So that's kind of the overview. Now let's go ahead and grab some of these harvest before the actual pests do. So let's kick it off by harvesting some of these Mad Hatter peppers. These sometimes have a little bit of kick to them. They're very thin walled, they're very tasty. We've become big fans of them, not just because they look cool, but because they do actually taste quite good as well. Now I think they will make a wonderful paprika powder, even though they are thin walled, which means that I'll need a lot more to make a sizable amount of powder. They have a great flavor to them. So I think they're gonna add a nice little punch of contrast to the rest of this pepper mix. And I'm just gonna go ahead and grab every single red one here, because I have quite a few of them. Some of them are actually even drying on the plant, which will help in the dehydration process. Now behind me, is one of those uh, frying peppers. This one's from Botanical Interest. So it's a little bit thinner, or not thinner, it's just not as wide as the Escamillo. This is called a uh, Marconi pepper, I believe. They're also very good, similar taste. It's a little bit better if you want a smaller pepper to stuff with something like cheese instead of like a rice stuffed pepper like this one would do really well for. So that's kind of the main difference there. Either way, these might go into eating tonight instead of into pepper powder because they feel very nice and firm and juicy. So. That's probably enough peppers here for one day. I have some jalapenos back there, but I don't know. I feel like we already got enough spice in here as it is. So speaking of the red jalapenos, actually, if you guys want to see, I could try making these into chipotles. A chipotle pepper is just a red jalapeno that's been smoked. There's actually one that I'm more interested in trying called Morita pepper, which is also a red jalapeno base, but you smoke it while it's still juicy. So you get a nice fleshy pepper instead of a super dry one and they kind of have a little bit of sweetness to them so let me know if you want to see that i have quite a few here that i can make use of just drop a note in the comments so the nice thing about broccolini is that it's very similar to broccoli in that it actually will continue to produce once you harvest it some people will even actually just chop the top off of their broccolini plant at the very beginning to encourage it to produce more side shoots because so when it comes to broccolini this is what you're looking for you're looking for a lot of side shoots if you let it head it'll produce more of a head rather than a broccolini stem. So obviously this is still delicious, will taste the same, but if you're looking for traditional broccolini spears, then you might want to top your plant early, which just means cutting the top off of it. For now, what I'm going to do is harvest any of these that are even close to ready, so we could get some more side shoot production. And man, looks like tonight, we're definitely eating broccoli for dinner. Gotta say, I'm pretty happy with today's harvest. We got a whole bunch of peppers, broccoli, broccolini, peas, tomatoes. 
and it's going to be a wonderful fall season this year. The plants are looking great, we're already getting some harvest, but now I actually need to go back to working on this secret project, which this is a little hint right here. So I'll see you guys next time. Maybe in the next video, you'll hear more about what this is.